you have to understand that Don had no idea how any of this stuff went together. He, he didn't have a clue, Sam. <laughs> Audition for a few schools, and uh, the best deal was with the Cincinnati Conservatory in Cincinnati, Ohio. So I uh, started there in 1962, and uh, within a year or two, I was hired to uh, play uh, fourth percussionist or extra percussion with the orchestra there in Cincinnati, and I just loved it. I mean, it was just it was something I always wanted to do, and uh just love playing in the big orchestra and i even like the repertoire or at least the repertoire that i played in and i just like the whole deal i like the classical approach and everything about it so but as i got a, a year or two older um i started getting more interested in in new music uh and from new music into the avant-garde music and uh, the problem is in, in the modern symphony, and certainly the way it was in the 1960s, is uh, you rarely got to hear anything modern. Their idea of modern was something written in 1911 you know, uh, or even earlier. <laughs> so, I mean, we occasionally played Stravinsky or Ives or uh, uh, I don't know, but um, nothing that was going on at the moment. And that was what I really got interested in. So uh, about that time, uh, well, we went on a world tour with the orchestra in 1966. And uh, I forget what was before or after that. Anyway, I, I met John Cage. He was, he was hired as the uh, composer in residence for the University of Cincinnati uh, Conservatory of Music, College Conservatory of Music, they called it. Uh, and so, as a result, uh, Cage uh, played a lot of recitals and concerts uh, at the conservatory at the university and around town. So I got to be involved in a lot of that. And, and we played a lot of his music. And uh, um, in fact, I even attended a, uh, a lecture he gave at the uh, I'm not sure if it was a university affiliated, but it was a, a, a group of psychi a psychiatrists uh, association in Cincinnati. And the room was packed. They must have had 100 uh, mental health type people working there. I mean, attending there. And along with us came Morton Feldman. Do you know who that is? Oh, yes. And Morton was, uh, had just been in town or he was passing through or something. and he, he heard his friend John Cage was gonna was being there, so he stopped by to say hello. And Morton was a lot of fun. He, he was a lot of laughs, a very loud New York brash kind of guy. And Cage was just the opposite. He was he was very retiring, shy, and uh, very. Uh, uh, he often let you come to your own conclusions. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I've got I've got like a thousand questions for you, but okay. So so one thing. Well, anyway, so uh, long story short, I. I knew I, my days in Cincinnati were, there wasn't any reason for me to stay there anymore. I, I mean, I, I love playing with the symphony. I love playing with the opera. I was playing with the Philharmonic, with its timpanists. I played with the Pops Orchestra. And I, I loved all that. But I just, at, at that age, you know, I was just burning up with the desire to play new music. So I thought, well, if I, maybe if I went to New York or Buffalo or someplace like that, I could get involved in something like that. So I, I applied for a scholarship to Manhattan School of Music in New York, and I got it. And so I went there in uh, September of uh, 67 and uh, started at Manhattan School of Music. And uh, while I was there, uh, my lady at the time was uh, friends with another lady whose husband was Dick Kunk, who was Zappa's recording engineer. And um, so Dick told Frank about me and my background, and he was very interested to meet me. So they called a couple of weeks later, and wanted me to come down to the studio, the Apostolic Studios down near the village in uh, 
New York. So I went down there and we had a talk and he wanted me to play and he was very impressed. And so I started with him that weekend. That was on a Friday and we went upstate New York and played two gigs that weekend. And then from then on, I just joined the band. We, we stayed in New York for a, a couple of months. And then by, uh, by March, we left. We did a tour across country and ended up back in LA where the other guys were from anyway. Well, it, it's an amazing story because you just described to me um, the way that you fell into working with three of the most important musicians of the 20th century. And that's a, that doesn't happen to everybody, right? You don't, no, you, you, you don't have to be at the right place at the right time. <laughs> so what's the secret? Well, it's just happenstance. You know, uh, I think almost anybody will tell you that it's because of where they were. Well, you, you have to have the talent, but it depends on where you are, who you meet, what you get exposed to, what friendships you develop, that kind of thing. And a lot of it's just luck. You know, you, you, you meet people. Uh, that's why anybody that wants to get involved in, in music or anything else for that matter, certainly the arts or anything, you go to a place where they have that and you make you establish relationships there you go you know you never know where it's going to go mm -hmm. well okay so i i, I want to back up just for a second because you described that you your your first teacher was in fact a timpanist and yes. yeah and so normally in orchestras there there's a division of labor between the the timpanist and the percussionist right they don't do the, that's true right they don't do the same thing so the percussionist doesn't play timpani and vice versa so right. I'm just curious as to how that worked in terms of your own training. So you studied as a timpanist, but you ended up becoming a percussionist. Yeah, T Stanley was, I didn't really study timpani with Stanley. He, he uh, I mean, I, we had a little bit on it, but it was mostly general percussion. Stanley was a very accomplished percussionist, as well as a, a accomplished timpanist. He, a lot of people think he was one of the best that ever played in the United States. And, um, you could tell that by me, I'll, I'll tell you, he was something else. He's still alive, by the way, and lives in Florida. Um, but uh, so he's the one that introduced me all the percussion. When, when I first went, my dad took me down to hear the orchestra for the first time. And after the show, uh, we went backstage and I, I got introduced to uh, Wayne Pascucci, who at that time was the principal percussionist with the uh, with the Pittsburgh Symphony Orchestra. And so we were asking him if he'd like to take me on as a student. And he kind of, I don't think he taught much or if he did, he had a full load. He said, you ought to, you ought to study with Stan Leonard anyway. I said, he said, he'd be a much better choice for you. And they, he, he, so Stanley came over and he, in fact, he said, nobody practices more than Stanley Leonard. <laughs> I'll never forget him saying that. So uh, that's how I got introduced to him. And then, as it turned out, he lived in the same part of town that I did, the south south of Pittsburgh, in a township called Mount Lebanon. So it was very easy for me to get over there for lessons. So I'm thinking that was around uh, early 1959, and I, I worked with Stanley until I left Pittsburgh in '62. Yeah, I, I don't think everyone understands that the, the difference between, let's say, an average orchestra and a truly great orchestra is often the the, the timpanist, right? It's 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 a really crucial role, and it yeah. it takes a very special kind of musician to to do that. Uh, it's it's an incredibly exacting and precise job. It's also a very esoteric profession. There's only one in an orchestra. Right. And there's only uh, twelve, fifteen orchestras that you can really make a good living at. So. The, the competition is pretty fierce. Right, right, yeah. So to to make it in a in a field like that, which is an incredibly competitive, is is no easy thing. Yeah, yeah. So would you say that he he basically formed your percussion technique, or or did that um, did you have other uh, people that influenced you with that? Uh, I wouldn't say that Stanley uh, influenced my technique as much as as uh, Ed Wubo. Ed later, Ed was the uh, percussionist, a percussionist with the Cincinnati Symphony. And so when I, when I went to the conservatory, uh, Ed was my teacher, and Ed really brought me along in terms of technique. And he was a devotee of uh, Fred Hinger, who was the longtime timpanist with the Philadelphia Orchestra. So I kind of learned his method secondhand, and 
with Ed's permutations. And uh, so that's where I, I really came along with my orchestral percussion techniques, it was more with Ed. But as far as exposure to the instruments and learning a little bit how to play them, it was definitely Stanley. He's the one that turned me onto the xylophone and uh, had me practice that, and had me take a few piano lessons. And I wish to God I'd have continued with the piano, but I never did. And uh, so that's, you know, that's pretty much, I, I'd say Ed was more formative for me with the, uh, as far as technique. And then when I left Cincinnati and went to New York, uh, I get, finally got to study with Fred Hinger himself. And at that time, he had left the Philadelphia Orchestra and accepted the position as, as temp tempinous with the Metropolitan Opera Orchestra. So, so rather than up in the Spanish Harlem in New York where Manhattan School of Music was, I'd get onto the Metropolitan Opera House, which is at Lincoln Center, every Saturday for my lessons. And all my other school work was up the Manhattan campus. Right. Okay. So the, the uh, one of the reasons I wanted to to go into some detail about that was just to to underline your your background as a as a classical percussionist. Um, yeah. And it, so again, the, the the trajectory you're describing, you know, starting from this this uh, this orchestral world, and then running into someone like John Cage, Morton Feldman, and and Zappa, ultimately is really unusual. I think. Um, and so, so you were saying it's it's it, obviously there's the, the, you have to have the talent, there's luck, there's happenstance, all of those things, but you also have to be somebody that that other people want to work with, right? So it seems that when you yeah. when you first encountered people like uh, Cage or or Zappa, they had the idea that this is somebody that I can I can work with. Uh, so what what do you think the qualities were in you that uh, that they recognized that that they would think you know this is somebody I can I can collaborate with. Well, uh, first of all, I had the desire, and uh, and I'm easy to get along with, or at least I used to be. I don't know if I still am, but <laughs> I, I certainly was at that time. And I just had an overriding um, desire to be involved in new stuff. And uh, in fact, when I was uh, at the uh, Manhattan School, I used to get down to uh, uh, slugs in the East Village and listen to uh, Sun Ra. And uh, I got to meet him, and I was talking with him, and I told him I had uh, a recording of uh, a piece I'd written for a symphonic orchestra that was in new notation and really having got pretty avant-garde stuff. And he said he'd like to live to it, so I brought him down to tape and and uh, left it with him. And I came back, uh, I don't know when it was, a few days later, and he said he really liked it. And, uh, so. I was very impressed with with his band. You know, he had kind of a large band at that time. I'm going to say ten or twelve guys, which in playing in slugs was not that big a place, but it was always packed. And uh, I told him, I said, you know, I'd, I'd like to join your band. I'd like to play with you. And um, he said, uh, he said, I'd like to have you, man. He said, but I can't. And I said, uh, why is that? And he said, because you're white. Huh. Huh. And I said, okay, well, all right. You know, I guess I can understand that. Everybody in his band was black, and, and he, I guess he had a black following. I don't know if he did or not. It seemed like he had as many white folks in the audience as he had black folks. But So that was my first, uh, uh, you know, it was very popular to talk about racism, racism today, but that was my first exposure to it. Hmm. So, um, but I really liked it. I'd, listen to some of Sunra's recordings back when I was still in Cincinnati and he knocked me out. I just loved his stuff. And, and uh, so when I got to meet him and talk with him, and, uh, listen to him play. And so, well, so I was, I was interested in the new stuff all along. It wasn't, you know, the, the, the problem is as far as going from, you know, leaping from symphonic type percussion, timpani, et cetera, into jazz, rock, pop was that, I hadn't sat down with a set of drums in several years. Anyway, I you know I had my chops, you know I could I could, my hands and so on were 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 well uh, in great shape. But as far as sitting down at a set of drums, I just hasn't done that in a couple of years. Uh huh. So the, the first time I sat down at a set of drums when Frank asked me to play some, when I went down to meet him at Apostolic, and. Uh, 
So when I sat down, I just played a whole bunch of freeform stuff, the stuff I've been thinking about and, you know, in the, in more in the Sun Ra mode than the, <laughs> anything else. And uh, it blew him away. You know, he really, uh, he really liked it. And so he, uh, he called in, uh, Roy Estrada was there out in the front room drinking coffee or something. So he had him come back and at first he asked, he said, can you play in five? And I said, well, yeah. <laughs> so I, I play a little bit in five and he said, oh, great, great. So he called Roy in and, and uh, in, the, in the studio and I picked up his bass and we played a bunch of stuff in five. I guess one of the, one of the tunes that they'd been playing that was happened to be in five. So I played along with that and he said, this is great, great. I can't, you know. Uh, and it sounds silly today when you say, can you play in five or seven? Because everybody can do that today. But at the time, nobody could. In fact, I'll tell you a funny story. Uh, I had a long conversation with Don Ellis one time. He just happened to stop by my house because he had a flat tire <laughs> and, uh, in, in, in L.A. And he came up and we chatted and he was telling me, he said, uh, he said, you know, the reason I hired, I think it was Steve, Steve Bonham or I forget his name, the drummer he had in the late 60s. The reason... I hired him because he was the only guy in New York that could play in five and seven. <laughs> and it was all, nobody else was into the, the odd meters or anything. So anyway, that kind of gives you an idea where, the, where it was in those days. And, and there weren't that many conservatory trained people in uh, popular or rock or even jazz music. You know, it was a while before the Gary Burtons and, and all the great players that came from then on came on the scene, you know, so it was, Having a conservatory trained musician in the band was something of an anomaly. In fact, the mothers, we had a couple, there were four actually, with Ian and uh, Bunk and Don. They all, they were all conservatory trained. Yeah, well, part of the reason for that might be that, like, the, the symphonic world generally in the classical world has, uh, it's extremely competitive it's, and it's very difficult to find a spot in an orchestra, obviously. But at the same time, if you are able to get uh, some kind of a permanent seat, in a in an orchestra, um, financially, you know, you're 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 stable, right? You don't have to wor yeah. you don't have to worry about employment, um, bet. right? And up uh, depends. Plus you, got a union. Sorry? Plus you have a union, <laughs> right? Exactly. Plus you have a union, so so you're protected. If you join a rock band and start going on tours, uh, you don't know if you're still going to be uh, having any employment six months from now, right? So oh, you know, that's right. Yeah. And uh, the popular music, uh, rock, jazz, it's notorious for guys not getting paid and guys getting screwed out of their money. And mm -hmm. you know, it's just, that's one of the reasons I got out of the business, but that's another story, but it's, you're absolutely right. And yeah. Where with a symphony, I mean, I could have stayed on and made my, made my union salary every week for as long as I wanted to, you know, I wasn't going to get fired. Right. Unless, unless I got sick or drunk or something. You know? <laughs> Well, there's there's something you mentioned when you were talking about Sun Ra. You mentioned that you had written a piece for orchestra, and you gave him yeah. you gave him a tape of it. So I, I want to know more about this piece. So I, I, first of all, I didn't realize that you also composed music, but I'm I'm curious about how how that came about, and if if you wrote other pieces also. Uh, not much in that format. I I took an advanced composition class, or I took an avant garde. I guess it was an avant garde composition class by. Uh, taught by Scott Houston. I don't know if you ever heard of him. He was a no, pretty fair composer, mostly around academia, but he, he did have, you know, he was an ass cap and all that and got a lot of his stuff played. But uh, anyway, he taught a course in that and there were eight or nine of us. And so that's how I got interested in, in composition. However, I hadn't gone through uh, the normal studies that a, a composition student would. You know, I didn't, I didn't, well, I, I did take a class of orchestration, but I, but harmony and all that, it wasn't, you know, but in the avant-garde, it was a different story. So, uh, cause I could stretch out and do what I wanted to do. So I came up with a, a I was, I met some guy like Michael Colgrass and, uh, I don't know who all, but some guys that were using different types of notation rather than the common eighth notes and the staff and all, all, all kinds of other stuff. Plus, uh, I had, for my senior recital at the conservatory, I had played a piece by Carlin Stockhausen. Oh, what piece? Zicklis. Oh, right. Okay. Recycling. Yeah. And uh, probably one of the first 
performance as it ever got in that part of the country. What year was this? Uh, uh, 66. That, that, 1966. That could Stockhausen is still, still alive, but uh, I never met him. But I, I had to mail away to get the, the score. And then, uh, but it didn't come with instructions. So you just had to kind of figure it out yourself. So I played, that was one of the pieces I played on recital. So as a result, you play, and you're probably halfway familiar with the piece, you play oh, yes. a circle of percussion instruments. And um, in fact, it, it, was, it was because of playing that piece that I got to, to where I kind of like that setup where you have a bunch of percussion instruments in a circle around you, and you can just go back and forth and around a circle and, and so forth and play. And I did a lot of that recording at Apostolic uh, for Zappa, which was subsequently used on some of his recordings, uh, you know, you can't do that on stage anymore, and so forth. And he, and even in some, uh, I wish I could quote the title for you. One of the albums that came out in the late '60s, I can't remember. He used quite a bit of that on there, and that was from those recordings I did for Dick, and I think Ian Underwood was there. Underwood was there, so I just fooled around and did a lot of improvisation. <coughs> And uh, they, they taped it, and so Frank was excited to use it. Well, this this is really interesting. Uh, I didn't know a lot of this. So you were you were writing avant garde music. You took a course in, in avant garde music. Uh, yeah. And uh, and you had you had tapes of these compositions. You gave what it sounds like you gave one of the very earliest American performances of of Cyclus by Stockhausen. Yeah, I had I'd actually seen a performance of that, uh, which got me excited about it. I went up to Antioch, uh, Ohio, Antioch College, and Max Newhouse. I don't know if you ever heard of him. Oh yes, uh, he uh, he was he was traveling at that time, I guess, playing the university circuit, and he played a performance. That was one of the things he played, and I thought, shit, this is this is amazing. You know, I really liked it. So I went up and talked to him afterwards, and uh, uh, I guess he was the one that. Anyway, I forget how I found out, but I I wrote. I had to write to Germany to get the score. Yeah, it's it's a remarkable looking score. Also, I, I guess that's how we got into it. The different notation; it wasn't common, and there was no there's no meter. It didn't say well, you know, you know, 140 beats to the minute. It was you know, it was all you know, pretty much uh, spread out the way you wanted to play it. So you were very deeply involved in in avant garde music well before you were working with uh, with Zappa and these other people. Oh yeah, yeah. So. Um, I wonder if you could talk a little bit more about about John Cage and what that was like. So he was presumably writing an original piece at that time, and that was being worked on by the orchestra. No, he didn't do anything with the symphony. He did more chamber pieces. I don't know if we played anything that he was re that he um, composed right at that moment. We played some stuff that he'd already written. Plus, he did a, a beautiful. He had a local uh, pianist. They played his entire prepared piano repertoire. That was a, just beautiful stuff. I mean, you know, and he, he was there helping her prepare the piano and they, she did a great job and got to hear all of that. In fact, Cage himself also did a performance of his uh, infamous uh, three minutes and 33 seconds or whatever it was uh, at the concert hall, which was, which was very nice. What did you make of that piece? Or, or... Well, I loved it. Uh, I think what, People don't understand about Cage is uh, he was very interested in ambient sounds. So it's not so much what the musicians were doing or weren't doing; it was what was going on while that was going on. At any rate, so when you're when you're sitting there listening to that piece, which that is to say, there's nothing to listen to uh, from the piano. Uh, pretty soon, you start focusing on what else is going on around it, and you can hear a a siren going down the street, or you can hear somebody coughing, or, or you can become more aware of yourself sitting there, that kind of thing. So that is the, that's the true essence of the piece. It has nothing to do with what he's doing. He's just sitting there. Uh, as it happened, I remember that performance because uh, some gal who was kind of a jokester, kind of a Weisenheimer, she uh, walked around, came off, came on the stage, and uh, went out and. Uh, and confronted Cage while he was in the middle of the performance. And he loved it. He huh. thought it was one how are you, he said, and how are you? So that was kind of neat. Yeah, but I think that's 
that's that's a, 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 a very important thing to understand about Cage's stuff, is that he was very aware of ambient sound. Yeah, no, there, there's a wonderful anecdote about Cage um, where he was... <laughs> He was he was listening to a Beethoven symphony with sort of a bored expression. And he had a friend over and they, they had a Beethoven symphony on. And at some point somebody rang the doorbell and he, he smiled and he thought this was wonderful because he loved the way that the doorbell sort of interfered with the symphony and the and the uh, oh, yeah. <laughs> the effect that that had on his perception of the music and and he and that made it a lot more interesting for him. So yeah, in fact, I I think he told me one time that he, his dream would be to have have everything that he ever wrote played exactly at the same time. <laughs> uh, he thought that would be, and I think uh, I think Frank uh, Zappa picked up on that later. I think he kind of had a quote like that. I think that's where he got it. So did did you have to uh, rethink your percussion technique at all, or learn any new techniques when you were working with Cage? No, except that you're you're working with a lot of new material. I mean, he did a lot of electronically enhanced stuff. You know, like a. Uh, just common everyday things. He put a contact mic on them, and, and so you move those around, and, uh, and then you could one piece we did. I don't remember the names of these pieces, but you could you could make any sound you wanted to. You could pick up a chair and drag it along the floor, or you could let out a scream, or you could do nothing, or you could you know play an instrument, whatever you wanted to do. And during a certain portion of the piece. And so in that case, yeah, I guess I didn't play some other instruments. Do you remember? I remember taking, I remember taking a xylophone mallet and uh, and grinding it along the strings of the piano, you know, and it made a loud screech, which was a great sound, but it ruined the mallet. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, that, that's the that's the other side of these uh, sort of extreme instrumental techniques is if <laughs> you you might actually end up damaging a very expensive instrument. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, yeah. There's. Do you, do you remember who some of the other musicians were who were working with Cage on this project? Well, we we're all local, so uh, oh, I can remember some of my chums at, at the conservatory worked along with us. But you wouldn't know the name. I remember Jamie Hafner and Bob Woodbury. Maybe Paul Pillar. I'm not sure if Paul was involved with that or not. But, but so none of these guys would have had any experience playing stuff like this. No. And they, no, and that was the case. That was the case wherever he went. I mean, I'm sure wherever he, uh, uh, wherever he was in residence, uh, he would work with neophytes as far as neophytes as, as far as his music. Right. We we did one show down at a uh, at a yacht club on the river there in Cincinnati, and and uh, Cage was to provide the music and do a lecture. Well, as the people came in, we Record them all with a tape recorder. You know, in those days, it was just reel to reel. Recorded a, 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 a few where they asked them to say anything they wanted or make any sound they wanted or tell a story, whatever they wanted to do. So then we took those, and while everybody was eating dinner, we made uh, tape loops of them. And we had, uh, I don't know, eight or ten uh, tape recorders to, to play them back and speakers throughout the hall. So that was part of the music we used for the performance. We just started playing all those things at once. And it was funny to get their reaction. Some people recognized their their voices, some didn't, and it was a little bit cacophonous. And and Cage was uh, running around just in heaven. He thought it was wonderful. Of course, <laughs> by then he probably had five or six drinks. You know, he was a little bit pink in the face. But uh, he thought it was just great. And then Pretty soon, I forget what happened. We looked around and, and he'd left. <laughs> he just left before anything was over. <laughs> huh. And and so in, 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 in this whole situation, so Morton Feldman was also there. Yeah. No, he wasn't at that show, but he was there. He might have been there for another one, but he was there when we went to give that lecture or when Cage went to lecture at the uh, Psychiatric Association. Uh-huh. And I'll never forget because Cage did a, a, a beautiful lecture, which which he always did, and it was interesting and humorous, and nobody could figure it out anyway. And so when we left, and after the after the lecture, they had a question and answer period, and so there were a lot of questions, and 
Cage always answered them, and it was it was a lot of fun. So when we left, the three of us were walk out of the building, and Feldman turned to Cage and said, "You know, Johnny." He says, "They just can't figure the artist, can they?" <laughs> and he was right. And Cage cackled because they they you can't take. You know, I don't know if there's such a thing as psychiatric science. I don't believe there is, but if there, if there is, you can't take that and apply it to artistic endeavors. Yeah, yeah. And he was right. Uh, it was really funny. <laughs> Feldman was a riot. He was a big jokester and pretty good writer too. Yeah, Feldman for me is is really one of the the great composers of the 20th century. He's a he's a really Oh, you think so? Oh yeah, oh yeah, he's a very important figure. Yeah, I'm not that familiar with his stuff. I've only heard a couple of his things. So Well, but uh, knew he was a big name. Yeah, there, there's a piece I wonder if you've heard of it called The King of Denmark, which is a solo percussion piece that he wrote. No, I haven't. Yeah, I can't remember what year. It's probably I'm probably going to get this wrong, but I th I think he wrote it in the early 60s. And it's a it's a great piece. I mean, a lot of people consider it one of the great pieces for solo percussion. And uh, I'll have to I'll have to look that up and listen to it. King of Denmark is called. It's called the King of Denmark. You might really enjoy it. And one of the one of the things about it is he doesn't specify the instruments. So so he just gives the general family of instruments. So he says, I want uh, like a metal instrument or a glass instrument or a wood instrument, and then you have to you have to yeah. sort of uh, choose what you're going to play it on. Uh, and he doesn't specify pitches and rhythms are very loosely specified in a, in a sort of graphic notation, but it, it's a great, great piece. Um, Sounds like a lot of fun. Yeah, it is, I think. And uh, it's very it's very popular as a recital piece also now for, for percussion students. But he was, uh, you know, he was a, a pretty big name in the avant-garde then. And of course, uh, Cage and David Tudor. And there was a lot of people at that time. Uh, there were some people, of course, Copeland was still alive. Zerensky, everybody was still alive then. So it was a great time to be playing. Yeah. And, and then one, two summers, uh, I did a uh, play with the American Wind Symphony uh, out of Pittsburgh. We toured the inland waterway and play concerts up and down the rivers in small towns that would never get the chance to hear a symphony uh, orchestra, except the enemy string, but it was the wind symphony. So with that orchestra, we played, the, the leader and the owner of the group was called uh, Robert Austin Boudreau, and uh, who's still alive, and he uh, he commissioned a lot of new works. So we got to play pieces by Alan Hovannis and uh, Mia Lobos. Oh yeah, um, Robert Russell Bennett. Um, oh, there's half a dozen. I can't even think of their name. Uh, David Ann Amram. Uh, quite a few people, you know. So that was a nice experience too. So at any rate, so uh, Bedreau, uh commissioned a lot of works, and so I got to hear a lot of new music then. I, I wish I knew new music today. I, I really don't follow it. I don't know who's writing outside of yourself and a couple of other people. But uh, although I've been hearing a lot about this uh, Jacob Collier fellow, have you? Heard oh yeah, him? oh yeah, yeah. Well, one one thing. One thing that's happened in in new music uh, is that well, because of the internet, it's really changed things a lot. Oh yeah. So uh, there are there are people becoming famous on on YouTube, um, and you know establishing real careers for themselves that way, which is quite amazing. And that that possibility did, possibility didn't exist even even ten years ago. No. So it's very. No, in fact, I remember it was a big deal if I was able to find a recording of Panda Rescue or somebody like that, I, or uh, you know. I can't think of the names offhand, but you know the new the guys are doing new stuff in the '60s. Mm -hmm. You just had to be lucky if you're able to find a recording of it, and that was that would be an LP. Well, yeah, I mean, you described having to write away to Germany to get the score for for Zyklus, uh, yeah. and you know, it, even well, for that matter, when I was a teenager, I was really interested in Stockhausen, but I couldn't find the scores, and I, it was very hard to find the CDs. They were very expensive, and you had to they had to be imported from Germany and. It would take weeks to get them, and the the score yeah. the scores were were they cost a fortune. You know, I'd have to save up to buy one, and it would arrive a month later, and this sort of thing. Oh yeah. Uh, and that that's completely been transformed now by the internet. So you can you can get scores uh, instantly, um, and recordings obviously also. So you don't there's no you don't have to wait anymore to see anything. And that, that well that that's definitely the upside is the uh, instant communications. The downside is everybody wants everything for free. Yes. Absolutely. Yeah. So.
In fact, my buddy uh, Bill Harker told me that's why he quit writing. He quit composing because everybody wanted everything for free. There was no way to make any money. Yeah, it's it's a really, really difficult thing to, to, to navigate, that's for sure. I don't know how in the hell the guys do it today. I mean, everything that, if you record something, all of a sudden, boom, it's instantly everywhere. And how, how, how can you monetize that? Very difficult. There are, there are ways to do it, but it's it's extremely complicated. I mean, yes, you're right. There's 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 two sides to it. So on the one hand, it's much more democratic. Any anybody can put out their music, uh, but at the same time, the the odds that you'll be able to make any kind of a living from it are much lower. Well, so you're you're better off in academia and, and uh, trying to get some stuff published and and played and that kind of thing. You're better off. <laughs> Well, a lot of trying to be out here on the road. <laughs> yeah, I mean, well, that's what a lot of people do is they 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 go for an academic career, um, and they have to. Well, let, let's talk about that in relation to you because you eventually did get out of music, or at least you got out of the music business. Um, yeah. Right, but I mean, so so you were saying earlier that that was that was partly because of well, it was because of the difficulty of getting paid in the in the sort of rock music yeah. world. Um, so well, we should talk about that. So. Um, well, describe describe your early experiences working with Zappa and and how it was that you were, you know, willing to move from a sort of uh, what could have been a very comfortable ongoing situation in an orchestra to something completely precarious. Right. Well, that's exactly how it was. Of course, I didn't know that going in. <laughs> right. They don't you tell know, you that. I, I, no, I I figured I equated fame or popularity with money, and that's not usually the way it works, necessarily. But, uh, you know, I started working with Frank right away, as far as I was in that recording studio over 15 hours a day, you know, uh, and it never occurred to me to ask him, uh, how am I getting going to get paid for this? You know, we'd get paid after the gigs. In those days, it was, uh, they you know, lined up right after the gig, and the uh, Kirby was standing there with a sack of money, and he'd just peel off a few hundreds. See, and that was how you got paid. And uh, but I should have known. Uh, I tell the story where you know the first weekend, Frank said we were going to go up and we're playing two college gigs up in upstate New York, and uh, he said he'd make about five hundred dollars. Well, five hundred dollars was a huge sum of money then. I never, I don't think I ever held five hundred dollars in my hand at that time. You know. I was making $132.50 a week with a symphony. And when we went on the world tour, because it was the taxpayer money, we, we were getting $170 a week. And I thought I'd died and gone to heaven then. So, uh, so $500, that got my attention. Well, when we got back, we got 300 and Herbie said he was going to give the rest to us later. And I'm still waiting. <laughs> so I should have known right away that something was fishy there. You'll have to get in touch with Gail Zappa. Maybe she can. <laughs> God rest her soul. Yeah, she. That's another story. But uh, yeah. So you know, we went along, and then by the time we went back to L.A. and did a few tours, why uh, they said, uh, "Here's what we'll do: rather than rather than pay you only when we're working or when you're doing gigs, how about we pay you two hundred fifty dollars every week, week in and week out, whether you're playing or not." And then every quarter, every three months, in other words, we'll have a meeting, do the accounting, divvy up the, the excess. I, and I said, well, I don't care. You know, it doesn't make any difference to me. I mean, I was, $250 a week was great for me. I thought that was just wonderful money. And, uh, but somehow, uh, when we'd have the meetings, there was never any excess. And it was always something like, well, actually, uh, we went over, you actually owe us money, but we won't, that's all right, we'll still pay you. But, you know, we had to buy this amp and we had to buy that thing. We had to play plane tickets, plane tickets and this and everything. So, uh, but I didn't care. You know. Now, the older guys were very suspicious, you know, like Don and Bunk and, you know, I said, you know they had the right out there. So, well, what do you mean? You know, where's the money? I was so happy to be playing and doing all this great stuff. I didn't care what was going on. I figured, I, I, you know. My rent was only two fifty a month. I had a nice house in Laurel Canyon. <laughs> what the hell are I care? So, uh, but then later on, uh, things started changing, and I started realizing that the music business was very treacherous business, and uh, everybody's out to screw you. 
And so, and it's always going to happen. And I'm sure you're aware of this. When, when the business people run up against the artist, the business people always win. <laughs> they know what they're doing. You don't. All you want to do is play your art, play your music, write your song, compose your quartet, whatever it is you want to do. That's what you want to do. You don't want to hear about the other stuff. And so you're very passive. So it's very easy to take advantage of you. And, and I'd say 90% of musicians are like that. It's just inbred into us. It's just the way we are. Yeah. We're, so heads are in the their minds in the stars somewhere and the, the arts and the music and whatever it happens to be and so we're very easy it's very easy to take advantage of musicians as a, as a as a group well they're they're creatures of passion and so they'll they'll they'll, they'll follow their passion with absolute devotion and right. uh, and and it's true and on a certain level that makes that can make them easy to take advantage of uh, oh yeah so well, okay, so I, I, I'm, I'm really curious about what it was like recording with Frank Zappa, because what, the thing I find really fascinating about the early Mothers albums is it's, they, they're clearly very carefully made. They're beautifully played. They're really nicely recorded. They work incredibly well as, as, as sort of musical statements. They, they, they have a flow to them. They take you somewhere. But at the same time, I can't for the life of me understand how they were actually put together. Because you take something like Uncle Meat, which I think is about two hours long, right? And, and it's got all these little fragments of music. Some of them are very short. It's sort of like a giant collage. And I'm just curious, if, was there a design to that? When you were working on it, did you have a sense of this is where this part will fit? Or were you just working on little short fragments of music the whole time? No, I, I think we, uh, well, there were some of that, like little uh, fragmented things. But uh, I think Frank, uh, and a lot of what Frank did was on the, on the run. I mean, he just on the fly. I don't think he sat down and figured it all out. Uh, he may have in some cases, but he did just whatever sounded good. And plus, remember, he was working with a uh, highly accomplished engineer, Dick Kunk, who was really something. I mean, he was, and... And at that time, no, you know, there were very few 16 track, or was it 12, 16 track uh, studios available. Everything was four, eight track. And now you had all this stuff that you could overdub and cut in and out and phase. And, and I don't even know all the technical terms, but uh, so he was just having a ball. Plus, Frank had a great sense of humor and kind of a twisted sense of humor, really. And a kind of a cuckoo, I mean, <laughs> a poo poo caca sense of humor, you know, <laughs> heavy in the toilet humor, you know, nasty, dirty, na na nini, that kind of stuff, which was new at the time. You know, today it seems kind of silly, but at the time it was very, you know, risque and very counterculture. So he was able to put in snorks and bleeps and bloops. And, and we messed around with a lot of stuff in the studio, you know different sounds and playing with brushes on a phone book and, and all that kind of stuff, you know, but it was, it was mostly, the most of the stuff I did when I first came in was, I mean, it was all recorded uh, separately, you know, like, uh, uh, for example, I redid all the drum tracks to uh, uh, Ruben and the Jets. He didn't like the way Billy played them, so he wanted me to, uh, overdub them the way he wanted it to sound so it did and uh and i added a lot of xylophone and i mean uh, marimba and so forth on this some of the tunes especially in fact i think the very opening of uncle meat was uh marimba and vibraphone the, the melody was played and that was ruth underwood and and i played that ruth hardly remembers that she said she was in such a state of mind that she hardly remembers but uh, we we worked real hard on that stuff and it was and it, but it was fun, and it was new. It was different stuff. Nobody, you know, he had a style all his own, and uh, so it was a lot of fun. But I, he, you know, pieced a lot of stuff together, and he made a career out of that. I mean, I, I think up to the very end, he was pulling stuff out of recordings he had from some gig in Podunk, and then he put it with a symphony piece, and he, you know, he just mesh it all together. I don't know if anybody could ever even figure it out. And he, uh, I don't even know if he left instructions. He'd have to ask Joe Travers, who was the 
Volmeister with all of Frank's recorded material now. And he does a hell of a job, by the way. But, uh, so I don't know. It's, but it, it, he just kind of winged it, I think, on a lot of stuff. Well, he had to have been one of the most creative people who ever worked in, in rock music, for sure. Um, yeah, I think he was certainly, you'd have to say, the first. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and, and so, but so when you were actually recording these albums, so he would show up with a, 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 like a, a piece of sheet music or he would play it for you yeah. or, yeah. No, he would usually have it written out, which, which made it a lot easier because uh, I just read the chart and, uh, and he'd, he'd, you know, he'd play, put the phones on and uh, the tape would roll and there you'd go. You'd play right over the top of something was already done. It was pretty easy. So, Although some of the parts were kind of hard. <laughs> did you have to approach your instrument in a different way at all when you were working with Zappa? Did he ask you to do things that were ever outside of your training or things that you were accustomed to? No, not as far as the playing. Uh, I did some different stuff. I mean, you know, I mentioned that one, uh, you know, that circle of instruments, and, and I was always bringing in new stuff to, you know, break drums and gongs and stuff, bicycle horns and all kind of stuff that I used to use. And he had incorporated those right away. I mean, whatever I brought in, he would use it right now. <laughs> so, so that was kind of fun. And that, that lasted even after we got out to L.A. I remember we did the, one of the first gigs we did at the Whiskey A Go Go, which may have been recorded, I can't remember, but uh, I used a lot of funky percussion instruments on, on that session on those dates. So he would, but I didn't even own anything. And I didn't own a vibraphone. That was his. And a marimba, that was his stuff. I didn't own, I owned my drums and some percussion stuff, but he owned all the timpani and all that kind of stuff. Becky I heard, uh, I heard he sold that vibraphone for $57,000 in that <laughs> office. That's an expensive vibraphone. Wow. That was probably more than I made the whole time I played. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Wow. Yeah, that that's amazing. Um, so okay, so this is, I mean, the, the trajectory that you're describing is is amazing, and it it's not, like you just sort of landed from one amazing uh, situation working with extraordinary artists uh, to another, and um, in addition to that, so you were playing at places like the Whiskey a Go Go, which was yeah. uh, obviously a, a hotbed of of, uh, of counterculture and up and coming artists and. So you, you must have been meeting some of those people in, in Los Angeles at the time. Oh, yeah. yeah I met a lot of the guys and the, the doors and, the, oh, I don't know. Just everybody was there. and Everybody was there. The, where we really met a lot of guys was there was a club uh, on the East Sunset Strip, you know, east of the where the Roxy and the whiskey and all that was. And uh, Marshall Brevitz had a rock club called The Experience. And which he had a similar rock club, big rock club in Miami. We played down there many times. And Frank and, and uh, Marshall got along real well. And Frank helped Marshall out a lot of times. So Marshall returned a favor. So, so all the guys would go over there. And it, you never knew who was going to. Marshall would hire acts to play. But oftentimes, whoever was in town would get up and just jam or play for free. So you'd hear, you'd hear Hendrix or Joe Cocker or the Mothers or the Bonzo Dog Band or, just, or Jefferson Airplane. But whoever happened to be in town, they would go over there and jam. So you got to meet all these guys, you know, and it was a lot of fun. And, of course, uh, Marshall, uh, to his detriment, but, uh, he'd, he'd give us free drinks, which was probably the wrong thing to do. But uh, that's what he did. And so we were was, everybody was happy to be there. <laughs> So it was a great club, you know. So you got to meet a lot of the guys, and, uh, and we go to the Troubadour a lot. I played a, a week there with Tim Buckley, and I met that crowd. And um, some of the guys used to hang around there. And uh, there was a few places in town. There was one place uh, way out in Topanga Canyon called the Corral, and uh, that was kind of the home turf turf of uh, the great of uh, Canned Heat. Bob Height and a lot of the guys lived out there. So they jammed over there a lot. So even before I joined Beefheart, uh, we'd go down to Malibu a lot and then take the Topanga, Can Topanga Canyon route back over the hill and stop at the corral and sit in and have a few beers. 
that was a lot of fun. You meet a lot of the people. Everybody was just kind of drifting around those days because it was very kind of hippified then, you know, kind of kind of the uh, middle part of the flower movement, I guess you'd say. So people were kind of loose and free with their time. It was a lot of fun. Yeah, it, it, what you're describing is a, is just an amazing and I think quite a unique historic moment also in music uh, with just an yeah. incredible amount of creativity pouring out from, from all directions. And uh, yeah. yeah. I mean, did did you feel that you were sort of creatively involved in the in in Zappa's material? Like, in other words, did you did you have any input into how you would play or what you would play, or was it just a question of of Frank giving you, uh, you know, lines to work on and he'd tell you how he wanted them exactly in every detail? It depends on what it was. If if it was um, something he'd written, you know, and I was playing the vibraphone or something like that, yeah, I would. It was just. I would just play whatever the chart was. But when it came to drumming or percussion, it was just you'd play whatever you wanted to play. And uh, so you play your own style. And of course, if you had to get a solo or something, that would be your stuff. But uh, it was pretty straightforward. It really wasn't anything that, that uh, and it wasn't that unusual. I mean, the playing might have been unusual, but the situation wasn't that unusual. Right. But anything that he had written, he always had charts, which was good because, you know, you didn't have to fool around. It was right there and you just play the chart. Right. So that and that that stands in contrast to what it was like working with Don Van Vliet. Yeah. Yeah. So <laughs> actually, so I'll, I'll just briefly say for anyone who's listening that you, you wrote a very interesting and very insightful article comparing Zappa and Beefheart, which is available, I think, on Beefheart.com. Yes. Yeah, so I'll I'll provide a link for that for anyone who wants to read it because it's it's a very interesting article. But maybe you could. I'm glad you, glad you liked it. Yeah, I did. It was it was very interesting because in a certain sense, it's it's hard to think of two more different creative personalities than those two people. Um, so I wonder if if you remember how you first came into contact with Don when you first met him, and what your impressions were. Yeah, I I first met him over at uh, Frank's house. He was running the Tom Mix Log Cabin in Laurel Canyon. And it was just probably in, uh, I'm going to say, uh, early, uh, maybe late 68 or early 69. And I was downstairs rehearsing. Uh, and I came up for somebody to leave or something. And there was this guy just sitting there in his armchair with that green coat and uh, with the fur on it and the top hat. And... Uh, I said, uh, he said, well, hello, how are you? And I said, hi, how you doing? I, I, I said, aren't you, uh, aren't you uh, Captain B or something? And he said, yeah, aren't you Archie? So we got to talk and then uh, had a nice conversation and I left. Well, then later on, uh, several, I don't know, a couple months later, we, we played a big uh, uh, charity gig for the, uh, how was the LA Free Press or, or something. I don't. I forget who the who it was for. Down at the old Hullabaloo Club, which was the new, which was going to turn into the new Aquarius Theater, where they did hair and all that. But at that time, it was still a rock joint, and uh, there was a big concert there, a big festival, and they had Jethro Tull and Can Heat and Don Ellis and Captain Beefheart and the Mothers of Invention. So, uh, and I'd never heard Don play. There were any of the guys I hadn't heard any of their stuff. Although maybe I can't remember if I'd heard Trout Mess Replica. I may have heard Trout Mess Replica a little bit and it knocked me out. So anyway, so when we weren't playing and they were, I went out and sat in the audience and listened to their stuff. And I thought, this is just great. I, I can't believe this stuff. You know, I mean, it's just wonderful stuff. So after the gig, I went back and we talked for a while and met all the guys. And Don said, hey, he said, why don't you come out to the house sometime? and uh, say hello or whatever. I said, well, I sure will. So I did. And uh, in fact, sometimes we were coming over to Topanga and I'd stop, but they live in Woodland Hills, which was kind of on the way of the, 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 the uh, notorious Trout House and uh, on Ensenada Drive in Woodland Hills. So we'd stop over there and talk with Don or the guys and he'd, he'd play me what we were working on at the time and play some of the uh, Trout Mess stuff. and. At that time, everything was muffled because uh, there was a house next door and they didn't want to disturb them. So, but it was a great time. And so that's how I kind of got to meet them. And then, uh, 
later on in 69, uh, Frank decided he was going to break up the mothers. And I, th I think for two reasons. One is it was very expensive to travel with nine guys on the road, or eight guys, however many we were carrying, plus a little sh a shadow crew we had. Plus, Frank, I think, got to the point where he wanted to do all the guys who were making money were the guys who had three or four members. Right. You know, the Crane, Blue Chair, uh, Vanilla Fudge, uh, I don't know what, the Jefferson uh, Starship, I guess they were called by that time. And, uh, of course, they were they had great material, That's make, but there were also fewer guys to pay. So I think he got his idea that it would be better to do uh, a group with four four members rather than eight or nine. So that was what he had in mind. And he told everybody, he said, well, I'll go out and play with other groups and then we'll come back and get together, which, which is all baloney. Anyway, so he, he decided to have, uh, uh, he got Ian Underwood to play and me and of course Frank. And he hired a bass player called Jeff Simmons. And that was the, that was the quartet. And so we started rehearsals and, uh, and it was some pretty good stuff, but, I hate saying nothing against Jeff, but I, I just didn't like the guy. We couldn't get along. I didn't like the way he played. I, you know, I I thought he was, uh, I mean, I, I'd been playing with uh, Roy Estrada for a couple of years. It was phenomenal. And, uh, and we we were very good friends. And, and playing with a new guy and, the, and his attitude, I, I just I just didn't like it. And Frank wouldn't come to rehearsal that much. So I stopped going. And right about that time, uh, uh, I had been going out to, uh, I, I, at the timeline, I'm not too sure, but all around this time, I'd been going out to uh, Ensenada Drive, and, and uh, Don wanted me to uh, join the band. So, and John French left. And uh, so I started playing drums with them, and, and, uh, but we didn't get a lot done, but we had some material. And about that time, uh, both Zappa and Beefheart had a gig at the Experience Club, it was a two two week two night two day set, uh, and I ended up playing drums with both bands, and I think that was probably the only time that both bands ever played together. It was certainly the only time I ever played with both at the same time. So the next thing, and that was uh, that must have been uh, very late late November of '69. Uh, so. But what was pressing, what was coming up was uh, Frank had a, a big concert gig with uh, with a group he, he was going to call the Mothers, and the L.A. Philharmonic was Zubin Mehta, who was the conductor at the time, a music director maybe, and that was going to be out at uh, Poly Pavilion at UCLA in West Los Angeles. So he started into rehearsals. Well, I just didn't go to the rehearsal. I wasn't interested, and I started getting involved with with the uh, beef art more. And uh, so, uh, anyway, long story short, Frank called me up and he said, hey, he said, are you going to make rehearsals? Or he said, I, I really need you to, to play. And I said, Frank, I said, look, I said, I don't think it's going to happen anymore. I said, I'm, I'm going to go along with Don now and play, in the, play with Beefheart. And he said, oh, he said, well, okay. And I said, well, no hard feelings, but uh, that's pretty much it. So, uh, so he got, uh, I think, for the gig. He got uh, Billy Mundy to come and play, and uh, actually we went out to hear the gig. I can't remember if it was, it may have been Don and Jan and I went out to hear it, or maybe it was Ian and Ruth, I can't remember. There were three of us, we went out to hear the show, and it was, it was pretty good. I mean, the mothers did a good job. I thought uh, Frank was a little disrespectful respectful to uh, Zubin Mehta. You know, he kind of kind of made fun of him, and so, but that's what Frank did, you know. But the show was pretty good. And that was uh, that was it, you know. So I never, I never played with him after that. Was that a difficult decision to make? Not really, because you know, I, well, there was a lot of things, Sam. But one thing I was, I was fed up with the. Um, I didn't understand. I didn't have a good grasp of why Frank felt the need to break up the mothers. And to me, we were doing a lot of work. It seemed like we were touring a lot. Everybody was making money. He was making money. Uh, I thought, why is he breaking it up? I, I just, it just didn't make any sense. The, the records deals were there. Uh, and so I, I kind of, it kind of hurt my feelings. I mean, and I remember we, we played a gig in uh, Charlotte, at the Charlotte, North Carolina Jazz Festival. 
And I went out and I was having breakfast with Frank. And that's when he said, you know, he says, I think I'm going to break out the mother. And I about got sick to my stomach. I said, you are? I said, what the hell for? And he said, well, he just, he said, I think we do better with a smaller group and blah, blah, blah. And he said, but I want you to play drums. And, and so I said, well, you know, I was both sad and glad. I was, I was, I was sad that the group was playing. I'd be glad that I was still able to play with him and with the other couple other guys. But as it went on, and we had a bad last meeting, you know, with all the guys and Herbie and all that crap. And, and I just got real sour about the whole thing. And and I got we got cheated out of some money. In fact, we got cheated out of quite a bit of money. In fact, we had to sue 20 years later to get record rolls that we never got. Frank uses to buy equipment and so forth that, that should have gone to us. But that's another story. So I was uh, I was very disillusioned with the whole thing, and I, and I was I was really enjoying uh, meeting, going out there, meeting with Don and the, the guys with Beefheart, and the the music was great. And uh, Don had all these ideas. I mean, uh, he had a he had a line of crap that you know I mean, he he could talk you into anything. So uh, he had me convinced this was going to be the biggest thing since uh, the Rolling Stones, you know. So I thought, well, shit, you know, I said, I don't care as long as it's solid, man. I just want something that's solid and something I can count on. <laughs> I didn't realize I was going for the frying pan into the fire, yeah. but uh, that's that's how it happened. So as a matter of fact, uh, uh, they, you know, I didn't really know what I was supposed to be doing in the band. I was playing drums and we'd get together. And I was kind of into free form playing at the time. And of course, uh, that wasn't meshing in too much with what they were doing. So uh, they gave me the records, and I, but nobody ever said, look, I think you should learn to play John French's drum parts from Trout Mask. Nobody ever said that. So I listened to it, and I said, well, that's great stuff. And we'd sit down and play it, I'd play something else. So uh, so I was, start, I was already kind of losing interest, and it was very loose, and, and, and I was having fun to, you know, um, BS with Don and we'd stay up all night and talk and that kind of thing. But as far as musically, I didn't exactly know where I was fitting in. So I kind of stopped going out there. And, and I think for a while I had to see me, Bill and Mark came over to live at my house in Little Camp for a while. One day I came home, they were gone, all their stuff was gone. Uh, that's interesting. <laughs> so uh, anyway, I talked to a few of so us. I called out there. And uh, to Ensenada Drive, and John French picked up the phone. I thought, well, okay. <laughs> so I said, what's going on? He said, well, he said, why don't you just come on out here? So I did. So it turned out they, they decided to get John back to play the drums. So I was kind of out of a gig. And uh, I forget who suggested it. They said, well, you play marimba, and, and there's nobody playing the second guitar parts. Why don't you play the marimba on the second guitar, or the second guitar parts on the marimba? Because Jeff Cotton had left by that point. Yes, he'd been gone before I ever really came out there. I mean, as, as far as when I started playing with him, he was around when I started going out to just meet them socially. And so forth. But yeah, he'd gone. So uh, they needed somebody to play the other guitar parts. So I started doing that. In fact, at first I didn't even have a marimba. I used to play it on xylophone. But we finally got a, a good four and a half octave marimba and I was able to use that. And so, but, so we'd just sit down and Bill would, he'd come over to my house and we'd sit down and he'd, he'd play the parts for me and I'd write them down on the score for him. And then I'd just put them up in the, on the, and, and play them until I memorized them. And so that's how I learned the charts, you know, what was, what was being played then. So to answer your question, I, I, there really wasn't that big of a, I mean, there was a transition, but it was an incremental. And it wasn't like, oh, I'm doing this. And oh, now I'm doing this. It was just, just kind of floated from one thing into the next. So we were st starting to talk about, uh, about your early work with Beefheart and how you came to join that group and how at first there wasn't really, uh, it wasn't clear what your role would be musically. I, th I think they wanted me to play a little like John. And uh, but uh, I didn't know how to play like John. Uh, I don't suppose John knew how to play like me. So, <clears throat> but I wasn't that that much interested in, it, and I didn't know that was the suggested role for me to play. 
So I just kind of ignored the whole thing. And I think I told you about that already. But uh, the irony was later on, several years later, after one of the albums, I think it was Spotlight Kid, John left again. And so this time, uh, when it became on me to play drums exclusively, um, I had the tapes of John's drumming for Trout Mask. And uh, so I was able to listen to those tapes, write down, there again, I'd write it down in score form, and then rehearse it until I knew how to play it. And play it precisely the same as John, but pretty close. So that's how I, so I eventually ended up playing that stuff anyway, <laughs> just the way he played it pretty much. And you know, I, I like his style of playing better than mine, but, but it was it was certainly good. And so that's what we did. And the same thing with uh, decals and everything else, of course. Uh, it was just, I was there to, from the beginning, so it didn't matter. Well, in decals, there's some tracks where you're both playing drums at the same time. Yeah. Yeah, so... And there's also tracks where you're playing marimba. So I want to I want to talk about how that came about, because sure. uh, so where where did the idea arise that you could both play drum kits? Because that's that's a very unusual setup for for a record where you have two drummers, and so I was I was kind of used to it because it was Zappa. We had both two drummers, and uh, Jimmy Carl Black played you know kind of uh, the steady workhorse stuff, and I got to band a little bit but we both played the drums and and, uh, and then I played some other stuff. but so I don't I remember why it came up that way I guess because I was playing marimba but on some song that there was no marimba so I figured it could put a second drum part I guess there were just okay, there were just two or three I think I can't remember how many there were I remember Japan and the dish pan and there was there were several so John already had an established part that he played, so my parts were just ad lib, you know, on the record, and uh, pretty much I played it similar on the road, but there was a lot of ad libbing there. In fact, I remember uh, we recorded that at the, the record plant, as I remember, out in West LA. And uh, when it came time to put the, my drum parts on over top of the track, uh, I said, well, let me let me try one. So I went out in the studio and they played the tape and and I and I played one and it was great. I just loved it, you know. And everybody was jumping up and down. And like, well, but they didn't record it. So uh, I said, okay, let's do a real one now. So I went back out and sat down and I played. It was okay, but I thought the first one was much better. But the one that got on the album was the second choice. Huh. How how would you describe the difference between your style of playing the drums and John's? Because uh, on that on that record, you get a chance to compare them, and they're actually on the on the in this final mix, they're panned left and right. So and it's also it's very easy to tell the difference. It's very easy to tell who's playing what because you you have very different approaches. Yeah. But how how would you describe that that difference? Uh, John was you know more stylistic, and uh, he had he played more. Uh, how do you describe? what that stuff was like. I, you might call it Delta, uh, March, uh, bluesy, jazzy. I, I don't know what you'd call it, but he, he had a definite style. You know, boom, boom, ta, boom, ta, boom, ta, boom, ta, boom, ba, boom, You know, uh, ba, boom, ba, boom, ba, ba, boom, 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 ba, da, boom, 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 you know, that kind of stuff. And uh, so he was he was very good at that. Now, it, probably had I worked at it long enough, spent a couple of months, I probably could have imitated that style pretty good. As it was, like I said later, I played almost exactly the same parts that he had played, but I learned it from him, the part. It wasn't just, it come up with my own. Now, as far as, uh, as far as decals, uh, I played more freeform, uh, more, uh, if you will, pictures and colors and shades and uh, uh, that type of thing. More moody. I, I, I don't know about moody, but, you know, it's played around more, you know. And a lot of times I, I would base it on what I was hearing in the phones, you know, like, for example, the second guitar part or Bill's or maybe Bill's guitar. And I would listen to it and I'd play along with it. I'd play off of his part. And so uh, that's why I had some... 
that's why it has a meaning. That's why it, it touched down with the piece as it went along. So but how involved was how involved was Don in all of this? Because you're describing, you know, learning parts from the other members of the band and so on. Uh, yeah. What, what was Don's role in all this? Did he ever give you things to, <laughs> to work on? Was he paying attention? Did he? Occasionally, yeah, later. But uh, you have to understand that Don had no idea how any of this stuff went together. He, he didn't have a clue, Sam. Maybe sometimes he did, but you know, there's a misunderstanding. I don't know if I should say this, but there's a misunderstanding going around that Don would work out these parts with the guys and he'd stand there until they learned it and then they'd put it all together and say, I want this here and I want that. That almost never happened. It was left to whoever picking out the whatever pieces, whatever parts of pieces he played from the piano and played on the guitar or in some cases the drums or bass, uh, it was up to them how it went together for the most part. So Don had no clue. He, uh, I mean, he didn't know that this guitar part went with that bass part and this it was going to touch down here at bar four. And the, you know, he didn't have any idea of that stuff. And it was no different than his. I mean, he didn't have any idea what he was going to sing on that stuff. It wasn't like he had lyrics that he wrote for Dr. Dark, or I shouldn't say Dr. Dark, because I don't know about that one, but some of the music, he had no idea what he was going to do. So he'd just take a poem that he had written and he'd transpose it on top of a on top of a piece that went together, put together by the guys in the band. Usually it was either John or it, more, more in my time was Bill. Bill would pull pieces, you know, pull parts off these, this mishmash of piano ramblings that Don did and these, Two hour sessions, he'd sit and just bang away at the piano. And he'd pick parts out of there. And I'm sure he picked out just whatever he thought was would sound good and play it the way he thought it would go together well. And then may, maybe Don had some input on saying, well, why don't you put that on top of this? Because it sounds similar. I, I don't know. I wasn't, I didn't sit in those sessions, but that's how that stuff was put together. And that is why. And this is an important part. The band always sound different depending on what band it was. Right. Mm -hmm. Every new band he had was a different sound. It wasn't because John Don decided to change his style. It was because whoever was picking these pieces out and, and coming up with these parts and putting parts here and there and everything, it was how they did it, how they played. So I, I don't know the, the later bands as well as I knew the previous band. But I'm sure that's how it was. Yeah. So, I mean, you're saying that, but Don really had no idea how these different parts would go together. But I mean, presumably he was he was basically only in a general sense. In a general sense. But I think one of the reasons why these albums continued to fascinate people so much. I mean, the the result is extremely unique. There's nothing else that sounds like yeah. those records. And part of that, obviously, is because of the extremely high high caliber of the musicians playing it, the obvious dedication, the the tremendous skill of all the players, uh, yeah. and the creativity of everyone involved. But there's also the fact that the process by which these albums were made, I think, is unique. And I actually I can't think of anything that was made in a similar way. And I, and I'm I'm thinking also in terms of 20th century classical music and all of this and there, there's really nothing where I can I can point to and say it's it's similar. Um, so this is this is the the result of an extremely unique way of working. And I yeah. guess my question is, is it fair to call Don the composer of these pieces, given that he couldn't have done it on his own? Obviously, he needed you guys, and you guys uh, needed also to sort out what all the parts were, figure out how they could fit together, more or less arrange them. What what is your point of view on that? I think Don was a was a, was the driving force, and uh, I think he was a composer, but he was a co-composer. And uh, I don't know about John because I didn't I wasn't around John that much when he was doing that that musical director uh, task, but I was around Bill a lot, and I guarantee you that. He should have gotten co-writing credit on a lot of that stuff because it was it was as much him as it was Don. I'm gonna tell you right now, and uh, and it happened with other guys too. But um, so he was 
Was Don the composer? Yes. Uh, would that stuff have got done without Don doing that? No. But uh, there was a lot of guys that had a hand in that stuff. Mm -hmm. Much more so than, say, with, with Frank, who Frank wrote everything. I mean, at least as far as the, 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 the written music went, as far as the composition went, wrote everything. There were some ad lib parts in it. There were solos and that kind of thing. But as far as the core music, Frank was the composer. So different story with Don. Right. Yeah. And I mean, the, the other side of it, too, is that the, the members of the Trout Mask Band have all described at various times what it was like working with Don at that time and how difficult it was psychologically and emotionally. Um, and I, I haven't heard too much in terms of what that was like during Lick My Decals Off. So from your perspective, was he, did he treat you badly? Was it a tense sort of environment or had, had things improved by that point? No, no, but, but if I can interject, um, I've heard both John and Bill, especially John, and maybe even uh, Jeff Cotton, I, I heard your great interview with him uh, from, from Hawaii. Um, the, <laughs> because of the, the relationship they had with Don, I didn't have quite the same relationship, but I think they were reluctant to say that Don didn't compose all that music. Uh, they, I mean, I think it was out of respect for Don and out of, uh, out of, uh, what's the word, starstruck, you know, starstruckness, that's a good word because of that and and i think they were so used to deferring to don that they didn't feel comfortable saying that but i guarantee you that a lot of that stuff was you know now on to the treatment uh, which everyone wants to hear about that um i saw some of that i uh, it, it was mostly with the guys that had been in the trout group and uh i was shocked the first time that i saw it you know like we'd be rehearsing and we'd be doing this and i all of a sudden we'd stop and Don would be on somebody's case. And a lot of times it, it was Bill. And it, it was never, you know, I don't think I ever heard him criticize anybody for not playing the part or because he played the part wrong because he didn't know what the part was supposed to be anyway. It was always about, he was, the way he was playing it, the, the feel that he was putting into it wasn't right. And uh, and I have to say, I think a lot of times that came up because Don himself was feeling wrong, you know. And if you put on top of that that he rarely rehearsed with a band, I mean, we didn't just sit down and Don pull out a mic and start singing this, his poetry on top of the song. It didn't happen that often. Uh, maybe before a tour it would, but, you know, almost never really. So he would get these notions in his mind and he would, uh, I don't know, he's bored or he, or he didn't know what to say or he was felt like he was put on the spot. So he'd always detect, uh, direct the attention away from himself onto somebody else. You know, it was variably Mark or Bill. And, uh, and the first time I had him, I thought, what the hell? And so he'd say, well, Bill is, is uh, this and that and everything. So I... He'd say, Artie, you talk about turn to Bill. I go, Bill, what's going on? So Bill tell me something that sounds logical to me. And Don said, Ah, it's full of shit. That's not true. That's not, you know. So and all of a sudden you're into this scene. And I think other bands go through that to an extent. You know, but uh, this happened, you know, fairly regular. So it was better when he wasn't around. And we got a lot more done. And then finally when we uh, when we left uh LA and we moved up to uh, uh, near Santa Cruz and then after that we moved up to Humboldt County, California, the Redwoods, uh, we'd still have those, we, we, what, what we got to refer to as talks, like the, the band would just say, might as well put your instrument down, we're going to have an hour talk. And so usually I just sit there and I, you know, it, it, it really got to be a pain in the ass. Because there was never any substance to it. It was all, it was all uh, woo woo horse pucky. It didn't, you know, it, it, none of it was, it was all crap. And so I'm sure, and I think most of it was gone. You know, he just, uh, 
I don't know if he felt like he's put on the spot or he just or he felt like screwing with somebody. I don't know what. I don't recall it ever being turned on me. If it had, I probably would have left. But that was, you know, bigger maybe, and uh, maybe Don felt intimidated by me. I don't know. But uh, but it was you know, pretty regular. Well, fast forward a couple of years, and by the time we got Roy in the band, that stuff slowed down quite a bit. And then by the time, and then Al, and then uh, Elliot Ingber, Wayne Neal Fingerling, he came in band, slowed way down. In fact, uh, Elliot yelled at him one time. He said, "Why don't you get the hell out of here, man?" He says, "Better next time you come here, you better get your ass in here and sing." He said, "You never sing." You know, he really rode him right at. Don left. <laughs> so that kind of helped out a little bit. And then by the time uh, uh, those guys left and Alex St. Clair came into the band, well, it was it was really getting good. And we didn't have many of those talks at all. Okay, okay. So yeah. so let, let's just talk a little bit about decals for a second because uh, like did... did yeah. Okay, so I know that with the guitar and the bass sound and things like that and the drums, uh, Don had often very specific requests like he he would he would ask bill to play with a particular gauge of of string a really thick sort of guitar string um don yeah, yeah. and uh, and and you know he would ask uh, that that they play with uh, with metal picks and and so on and so forth what about the the well, that, that was going on before decal yeah well right so so what about with your marimba parts did he have any uh any particular idea about what he wanted the marimba to sound like not a peep I never heard one word about the marimba except, uh, you know, I get a compliment or something. One time, I think that what was the, uh, was it full of wine, whatever it was, there was, a, there was a marimba break in the piece. It was a lot of cacophony going on. And I was like, blah, like, blah, 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 this marimba thing. And it lasted, I don't know, 30 seconds of that. And uh, that was something I pulled off of Don's tape. I just ended up playing something that I thought sounded good. And I wrote it down, and that became the part. And I played that part on the recording. <laughs> the part he couldn't have if you held a gun to his head he couldn't have told you one note that was in that thing he had no idea what was in it. but the, the funny part about it is it was well rehearsed and uh i remember one of when we did with bill the, the marimba and the, and the guitar we were in separate rooms and uh we just played through the phones and so we but we had played it so well and we thought so much the same that I think we just did one, maybe two takes and got the whole thing. And that was all free. There was no one, two, three, four. It was all floating over the, you know, which is tricky to do, you know. Yeah. If you don't know the guy you're playing with. Well, I, I... So to answer your question, no, I don't think Don ever had a comment about anything I ever played in Marimba at all. Yeah, I, I have to relate an anecdote about that. So you, you just mentioned the introduction part of uh, The Clouds Are Full of Wine. Class full of yeah, wine, yeah, yeah. So when I was 18 years old and I started studying composition, I went to, to take lessons with a guy in Toronto who is a huge beef heart fan. And uh, the first assignment he ever gave me was to, he gave me a tape of decals and he gave me that track, The Clouds Are Full of Wine. And he said, you're going to transcribe this by ear for next week. Oh. <laughs> so that was my first composition did lesson. Did you send me a copy of that? No, I don't think I did. No. Okay. Um, but uh, yeah, so that was my first composition assignment and I took it home and I, I had to listen to it about 300 times to do it because first of all, figuring the rhythms out is not easy because they don't relate to a common pulse and the tempo keeps oh, changing. Right. There's no steady rhythm. It's a float. The, the notes are easy. There's not that much to the notes. Yeah. You know, the pitch. But the, the reason I act if you sent it to me was I remember years ago, Somebody sent me a, a chart, and he had meticulously written this thing out. 
and so it could be produced the same way every time. And I wrote him back. I said, "No, man, this that's not it. I mean, it's, I'm really impressed with what you did, but this was not played that way. We didn't go one, two, three, four, one, two, three. Da, 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 da. No, it was just it was a float and a feel, and we just kind of played it over. As a matter of fact, you could probably characterize a lot of the Buffard parts as floating over the other part. Mm -hmm. it, well, it, it, they would touch down." Uh, I think it was interesting that guy Tony Malone. I don't know if you know him. He uh, he wrote. He figured out a way to write down all those parts and and have them sync uh, according to what they sounded like on the record, so other guys could learn to play the tunes. And he did a pretty nice job of it. But there again, it was it, it wasn't conceived that way at all. Right. Yeah. And and the the challenge is in those in those passages where you're all playing together at the same rhythm you had to somehow figure out how to play together and and change and do all those tempo changes uh and you just have you just develop the same spatial feel that's why john could say and and it would start you wouldn't go one two one two three four you know because everybody knew what it was they knew the exact tempo they knew the exact notes they knew the feel everything else so it was so it was very well rehearsed you know, that stuff yeah yeah no it but the funny part about it is while we're on that subject much later on, uh, when after John left the second time and I started playing the drum part, we redid a lot of those, where a lot of those parts went. And uh, which to me made more sense than some of them, the way they'd been recorded earlier. And uh, we're playing for Don, he loved it because he had no idea what, <laughs> you know, he, he just, oh yeah, that's what I want. So, uh, but we made a lot of changes. So it wasn't like somebody that came in that, that with this composition say, here, play this. And he said, oh, no, no, that's the wrong note. And this beat goes here. Didn't happen. But the way you played it, he, 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 you know, he, he always seemed to be able to tell if somebody was not into it 100%. You know, they're just kind of playing around with it. Uh, I mean, that was one thing that he demanded as a kind of a quasi-band leader is that you had to be 100% when you played that stuff. And we were. <laughs> so uh, it, that's why it usually came out pretty well. I think the audiences that heard it liked the energy as much as they liked the music. Do you remember when the album was released? Um, did, you, did you hear it when it came out? Uh, no. Well, I, after it was released, sure. You know, we'd, they'd always send you a box of albums or whatever they sent you. And you'd, listen to the rec actual record but of course we just heard it all in the studio although we didn't hear it with a vocal yeah and well what what did you it was the first time we heard it with a vocal what, what what did you think when you first heard the recordings did it sound the way you expected was it surprising pretty much yeah and of course with a voice on it it was different you know as far as i was concerned it was an instrumental group and then he put a voice on later <laughs> so i mean that's just the way it was so and i i was an instrumentalist and i always uh, I always listen to the instruments and I always listen to instrumental playing together. And to this day, I don't hear lyrics very well. I just, I was an instrumentalist. I learned, you know, I vocal. I mean, you, you can name for me a, a dozen popular songs. I couldn't tell you 10 words from any of them. But I, if I like the music, I like the song. You know? mm -hmm. Yeah. So, uh, but the, 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 with, with the possible exception, to answer your question, is... The last album we did was called Unconditionally Guaranteed. And uh, we really worked hard on that album. And we all thought we had a really, really good album. Because it was, there was a little bit of the old stuff, but there was some actual good songs in there and stuff you could tap your foot to and sing along with. And, uh, and it was my contention all along that we should play some more commercial stuff. Uh, that way we would get more gigs, maybe more people buy the records, and we'd make some more money, you know. As it turned out, I was dead wrong. And you know, that group would never have been believed as a, as a commercial group. But at any rate, so we played that album and we rehearsed it and we really had it good. We went down to the studio in Hollywood and Andy DiMartino had an office nearby. We laid down all the tracks and they were beautiful. 
they were they were just tight and they had a lot of good playing on it we had a good keyboard man that added uh, mark marcelino and uh i played drums i mean just an alley everybody was great so we all left went back up to humboldt county while don uh, put the vocal tracks on so i didn't hear any of that and uh so when the when the album was finally printed uh they sent us up some copies and there was a, a record store in Arcadia, California at that time. And they were real big uh, fans and promoters of our music. In fact, they even gave, uh, you know, they even rented places to live to Bill and Mark, as I recall. So we, we got the record, we went in there and we put it on the turntable and fired it up. And uh, the first couple of songs, I thought, geez, this, is, this stinks. And I thought, well, it's going to get better. And the whole album was pretty much like that. And I thought, what have they done? And what they did was, in order to get Don's low growling inflections all, they pumped the track down so low you could hardly hear it. And it's because of that, you couldn't get the feel of the music. And all you could hear was his voice, which is okay. Could it have been better mixed? Maybe. Maybe that's what it was. But it was just a damned embarrassment. And I remember looking up at the guys that owned the record shop and said, I'm sorry, man. You know, we just, it's just no good. So that was the only time that I, what you're alluding to, that I heard the album after it was done. And I thought, Jesus, this, this is, this stinks. And that was the beginning of the end of the band. Yeah. Yeah. I guess that, that would have been the last project you worked on with Don. Well, and it was because of that project and because of the, the few things that happened after that that we decided it was time to, you know. So what we did was we got together and said, look, we had a tour coming up. We want X amount of dollars per week. Let's make sure we got a return airfare. We don't want to get stranded over in Paris somewhere. So uh, we called up Andy and said, look, this is what we want. If we don't get it, we're not going on the tour. And so he went out of his mind. and. He, called back on the big hub hub and uh, he flies up to Arcata and we all get together and it was this big meeting and scouting and all this, but nothing ever came of it. And they wouldn't give us uh, the money that we wanted. So we said, screw it. So we, we said, we ain't going. And I felt sorry for Don years later because he had to put together a few guys. It was terrible. I mean, <laughs> that was that blue jeans and moonbeams or something. And that tour they did and everybody was shouting out, where's, Where's Drumbo? Where's Ed Marimba? Where's Zudorn Rolla? And he had John, the uh, poor guy, he had to just joke his way out of it and act like they were, and they weren't playing anything like this stuff that was on the records. That was pretty bad, but uh, that was the end of it. And I think they could have come up with a little more money. They just didn't, they didn't want to be uh, on the receiving end of it, getting the orders. Okay, so it, it sounds like you're, you're describing that by the by the mid '70s, you, you were you were starting to get pretty disillusioned with not only the band but with the music industry generally. So what happened after that? I mean, when this was well, this I, I'd already had it with the music industry generally, but I was getting a little bit disillusioned with uh, uh, Captain Beefheart and the Magic Band. And uh, the fact is, we weren't making any money. I mean, we were being provided for, but it, 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 it weren't getting. Uh, you know, four or five hundred dollars a week in a check account every week. It was just, you know, living hand to mouth, really. It's it's fun to be artistic if you, if you have somebody to support you. <laughs> yeah. So so this was a this was sort of a gradual process, and I guess that at one point you just decided it it wasn't worth it. You wanted to do something else. How how did how did that happen? I was really fed up after uh, unconditionally guaranteed, and so was Alex. And so we got together one night and said, look, we got to tell the other guys it's time to, we got to do something. So we called them, called them together, Bill and Mark, and we all sat down and we said, look, this can't go on. We can't keep doing this. And uh, we're coming up with sounds like quality stuff and it's coming out like crap. And besides that, we're not getting paid for it. And we still have to put up with this crap. You know, Don's driving around in a new car and we're sitting here, you know, so that's when we decided to kind of in more or less mutiny is what we did. So then we got together and approached. Uh, we had this tour coming up, big tour. We said, now's the time to do it. And we had some uh, negotiating chips. 
So we did, and it didn't work out. They wouldn't budge. They wouldn't, they wouldn't come up with another 50 bucks a week. So I, how important was it? You know, and Don didn't have any, he didn't know what to do. He had no clue. It was all the, at that time, he was being influenced a lot by the DiMartino brothers, Andy and his brother. They were producing the albums. They were, I think, managing him. And they were very uh, assertive guys, you know, New York guys. And Don was falling along with what they told him to do. I'm sure that's what it was. Plus, they had friends. They thought they could get into the band and everything would be hunky-dory, except that it wasn't. It was terrible. So I don't know. So Don eventually kind of, I guess he, I don't know how long it was before he did anything after that. Because I think it was by, by 1978, after I got out of the music business, came back in, I went to hear Don at the Whiskey. And uh, I went up to talk to him afterwards, and he asked if I'd play on their new album. He uh, asked me to come around first, and I knew what that meant. He was trying to get, to get me in the band. Uh, they were doing a new album called Shiny Beast, and, it was, and they were going to record it up in San Francisco. I said, well, I'm about to start chiropractic college and I'm not about to stop that because I want to actually get into something that I can count on where I'm calling the shots. <laughs> and uh, so he said, well, come on up and, and do the album and we'll just pay you for it. So that's what I did. But uh, so by that time, he'd got a band together and I don't know the, and he had Bruce Fowler, a fabulous musician, and Benny Wally, I think, was playing. and. I forget who all was in that band. Yeah, but at, at a certain point, you just decided you, you'd rather do something else. And it it, it, yeah. did, it didn't occur to you to go back to the classical world or or to become an orchestral no. timpanist or anything like that? No, right, not right at that time. Because right at that time, I got an offer from my father. Who, I grew up in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Now, he had an insurance business and he was doing very well. And so he asked me if I'd like to come back and work with him and learn the insurance business. And I thought, well, I don't know a damn thing about the insurance business, but I don't have anything going on right now. And at that time, the guys were still around. Bill was still living in Arcade, and I was living there. And see who else? I guess Mark was around. Uh, and so Bill was working on some new material, and I'd get on, and I'd have some input on that. Bill did most of it. I had a little bit of input on it. Some of the music, some of the lyrics, but it was mostly Bill. And uh, and I thought, well, this is really good stuff. And, and this stuff eventually found its way onto the Mallard album. But at that time, I thought, okay, we got this stuff. What are we gonna do with it? We don't have any, we don't have a contract. We don't have a uh, we don't have any tours. Uh, what are we gonna do? Play taverns, you know? So. Uh, I, I just couldn't see any future in it. And I got tired of, you know, I got a job uh, here and there and tend a bar and would play a little bit of music. And, and I thought, this is stupid. So I took my dad up in the offer. And that was in uh, 75, I think. Yeah. And uh, I went back to Pittsburgh. And it took me three years before I realized that it wasn't for me. And, I, and to be honest, my dad and I didn't get along. So I said, I'm, I'm, I'm out of here. I'm going back to Hollywood. So when I did, in fact, I called my friend Barry Barlow with the great drummer with Jethro Tull. And I said, if you have any way to send me some equipment, that this, I could use it. You know, but I was looking for timpani and marimbas and stuff like that. Well, he sent me a set of drums, which I still have, by the way. And uh, so I started to, I thought, well, I'll just start back into the, uh, Recording, but you know, I was doing session work before I left LA with uh, Beavard. I was doing, I did the Smothers Brothers show. I got offered the part for Oak Alcutta, the, the percussionist over there. I got, I, I did a uh, record with Al Stewart. <clears throat> it's a pretty good context. But meanwhile, when I left and you come back three years later, it's like, Art who? <laughs> oh, did you used to play here? You know, it's all changed. So I was starting all over again, and I had limited amount of equipment, and I I got a few gigs, mostly just from hanging around with Ian Underwood. He he got me a few gigs, and I thought this this isn't going to work. I mean, and it's not the same. I most of my career was with an organization, with a band. It wasn't you know, I wasn't like a hired gun cowboy, 
running all over town trying to beat some other guy out of a gig to get the to get to play a marimba part for some, you know. So by that time I was being treated by a chiropractor in Hollywood, Dr. Joel Hansen. And out of the blue one day, he just mentioned it to me. He brought up, he said, did you ever think about going into chiropractic? I don't know what he saw in me. And uh, I said, well, yeah, but I'm, you know, I don't know any about it. And I said, I'm, I'm getting a little too old to start another career. And he said, ah, baloney. He said, he said, here's what you do. You get down to, there was three chiropractic colleges in Los Angeles. He says, you get down to talk to the dean of admissions. And you take a hundred dollar bill and you paste it on your forehead. You walk into the dean and you say, I'd like to start taking classes here. Can I join your college? <laughs> and he said, they'll let you in. So he was joking, of course, but that's kind of what I did. So I went back to LA college because I had plenty of college, plenty of college credits, but mostly in the humanities and the arts, no science courses. So I had to go back to LA Valley College and take anatomy, physiology, and, and physics, and biology, and all that stuff, just so I could get into the chiropractic school, qualify. So I did that. And, and I remember the first, uh, the first couple of months I'm in school, I get a call from, uh, I forget the guy's name. I think it was uh, the manager or road manager was Zappa. And he said, hey, uh, Frank wanted me to call you. He said, uh, uh, we got this big European court tour coming up. I wonder if you can play drums. And I said, what? Meanwhile, a few years ago, I'd, been, I'd come in and I practically begged Frank to throw me some studio work and he didn't give me anything. So now he wants me to play drums on this tour. And I, I haven't played drums in a few years. But I said, I can't drop everything. And, and it turned out Vinnie Colaluda, forgive me if I'm pronouncing that wrong, real good drummer that he had, uh, he got sick and he couldn't play the tour. So Frank knew I could learn the material quickly and he wanted me to play. I said, I can't. I, I, I'm not going to drop this for a couple of months and go over to Europe and, and, and play a gig. And I said, why didn't they ask me two years before that? You know, I, I, I'd have done it, you know. Then uh, my friend Barry Barlow said he was going to quit the toll. And because he had a couple of girls who were becoming of school age and he wanted to be around for them. And he said, when they get to the school, I'm going to quit. And he said, I want you to take the gig. I said, really? He said, yeah. And I'm thinking, Gee, that's big money. <laughs> they were making good money. They, they played all sold out, you know, civic arenas and stuff. Because we did a long tour with them, and I knew what kind of audiences they were getting. But at that time, there again, I was already into this new thing. And at that time, I was still in Pittsburgh. And I said, I can't, you know, I just can't do it. I was never offered the job, but I'm sure it would have worked out real well because I knew Ian very well and the other guys, Jeffrey Hammond. And, and Martin Barr and those guys, you know, they were all good friends because we did a tour together. And I'm sure it would have fitted in very well, but at the time it was wrong. That kind of goes back to what we were saying about being in the right place at the right time and being able to come up with the goods, you know. Who knows, maybe I could have been a genuine rock star. <laughs> <laughs> well, it all worked out in an interesting way. Yeah. And, uh, and you know, you, you, you got to participate in some of the most extraordinary musical adventures of uh the last uh, 50 years and that's a that's a unique thing to have done yeah i i think so yeah i was, I was very fortunate very fortunate I, and i sure enjoyed it for the most part so did you did you stay in touch with don at all after you after you left the magic band oh yes oh yes not for a while but by the time i got licensed in chiropractic and i practiced a year in hollywood i moved back up to where we used to be in north california and near Trinidad, near up above Eureka, California, on the Redwood Coast. So I opened up a practice there in a small town called McKinleyville. Well, sooner or later, I found out that Don was living up there, too. So uh, I forget how it worked. Anyway, we got together and, and uh, spent a lot of time together. In fact, Don would come in for chiropractic treatments to my clinic in, in uh, McKinleyville. Um, and so, we, and then we get together sometimes, have dinner, or go out for drinks or something. And, uh, but then one day Don came in and he was, uh, he couldn't stand right. He, he, he stood there and he, he, he starts swaying. And I, I told Don, I said, can you stop that? 
can you stop doing that? He says, no, I can't. And I said, well, so I adjusted him and everything is low back and boot well. And he got, he was okay for an hour or so. And then he, so he kept coming in. And I finally told him, I had him and Jan in the office. I said, look, I, there's something wrong with you. I said, I, I don't know what it is. I said, but you got to see a neurologist and let them diagnose you. I said, don't worry about it. You just have to find out what it is. I can't help you with that. It's not, it's beyond my capacity to help. So he didn't want to go. And I think he was afraid that he had something deathly wrong with him, which he did. But we didn't know it at the time. So Jan, I talked to Jan. I said, you got to get him to get down there. You know, just make an appointment. They're a pretty good neurologist down in Eureka. So month, month in, month out goes. And uh, I'd go, like, usually I'd, I'd be out partying and I'd decide to stop over at his house after hours. And I was usually half in the bag when I went over there. So we'd BS and uh, one night we got to a, uh, we both got pretty loaded and uh, having some funny stuff happen. So anyway, about a week later, he calls me up and we had this big argument on the phone. And uh, I basically said, screw you and hung up the phone. That was it. And we never spoke, we never spoke again. But later on, I found out that John, uh, that Don had, uh, he had been diagnosed with, which I heard was MS. I, I never knew for sure that's what it was, but I think that's that's what it was. And he had the bad kind. We, uh, you know, a lot of people have MS. They have remissions and exacerbations. They get better and they get worse, and they but they they have a normal lifespan. Well, he had the kind that didn't work out that well, and I think he just went down bad. In the last couple of years, he was pretty much mute, and uh, yeah, it was bad scene. But I, I had no knowledge of that. I wasn't, you know. So I finally left. Uh, uh, I left that area in uh, 2000. And by then, uh, I'd had no contact with Don at all since '93, really. But we live in less than a mile apart from each other, but we had no contact whatsoever. Too bad. Well, I just have one more question for you. You've been you've sure. you've, you've been very patient with with my ramblings and uh, inquisitions. So thank you for that. Um, it strikes me that uh, fifty years after Trout Mask and Decals and and other uh, albums from that period were released, l the level of public interest is still extremely high. There there are millions of people listening to these albums, and not to mention the Zappa material, of course. Um, and if anything, the audience seems to be expanding and successive generations discover it and get excited by it. And um, there's just an enduring fascination with this music. So as somebody who participated in that, who was, you know, who is an active collaborator, why do you think that is? Well, first of all, they were unique and they managed to get their stuff out there. Zappa much more than Don. But... Uh, Nothing was being done, anything like it at the time. And really since, there's been a few imitators, but that's a hard thing to imitate, especially the beef art stuff is very difficult to imitate. And I think that um, because they both died so young, uh, Frank was, I think, only 51. Uh, Don was, I don't know if he got to be 70, maybe 60, uh, let's see, late 60s. Of course, he'd quit music, just uh, just doing painting uh, exclusively, which is probably what he should have done from the beginning. <laughs> but at any rate, uh, so they they acquired a legendary status. Uh, I mean, you can look at bands like uh, The Fall, uh, uh, The Residents. Uh, you know, a lot of a lot of bands have, have kind of got similar to that, but most of that was on the on the backs of guys like Zappa and Beefheart. You know? uh, there wasn't anything like it happened before. Uh, there was nothing at all. And so I think that, I think that plays a lot into it. Plus there's a lot of myths that have grown up, most of them not true. And uh, so that stuff gets around, and, you know. Plus the stuff is good, I mean, 
it was so far out at the time that it kind of fits in today. It maybe even a little far out for today. Certainly some of the B parts. A lot of guys, uh, musicians were influenced by it. A lot of composers were influenced by it, portions of it. It's kind of like Stravinsky, uh, you know, I don't think there's a composer alive since 1913 that hasn't been influenced by Igor Stravinsky, and especially the Rite of Spring. It's just everybody, they hear that stuff and they yeah, I gotta do something with that. I, I gotta use it. I gotta use that orchestration. I, I gotta use a line like that. Why didn't I think about putting the contra bass together with the piccolo or, you know, uh, so, so in a, in a, in a, in a compositional sense, I think that's why they remain. And I, I suppose some of the stuff is studied. I don't know if it is or not. Well, it is. I, I can, I can tell you from personal experience that, uh, classical composers and performers are often very familiar with that music and, and love it. And um, they they seem to particularly engage with it somehow. Uh, maybe well, you know, I, it, it occurred to me that up until um, maybe the last generation or or so, there's never been a a fusion of, of quote classical symphonic chamber music with jazz rock. I mean, to where um, the the boundaries were blurred to where you could do something like it would make it into more of the mainstream of of whatever's going on now in, in a different way than it could have say in 1950 or 1960 or even 1970 it just you guys today composers and musicians i mean they're all so good you know they're all they all play so good they all write good and they, you know they've heard everything that was ever recorded and and so it's it's there's kind of an interesting blend or fusion of that stuff which it never could have happened before. I, mean, I, I was it, there was never it, when I was in the conservatory scene there was never any jazz taught in any school. I mean they may have had Berkeley and and where is it Philly or Boston or whatever, but there was no jazz ever taught at the conservatories, let alone any any uh, funk or or anything like that, you know. That was all done on a, on a pop idiom, you know, it was done in clubs and back rooms. And, but now all that stuff is mainstream and people combine it. Uh, you know, as mentioned earlier, uh, this Collier kid, uh, you know, he's fusing so much stuff together that it's, it's really remarkable, you know, with jazz and the uh, uh, harmonic series augmentations and, and microtones and uh, but the limit to what you could do with tonal harmony and that's just it's just time to do that now it's you know people have been doing stuff like that and what other guys are doing i have no idea i wish i did know and that's why it's so nice to hear your music it's, it's nice to hear what's going on so uh i don't know why it uh, i mean we i don't know if we had any Guys like that, we were growing up, you know, sitting around talking about uh, Bix Beard or Beck or, <laughs> or uh, Chick Corea, or not Chick Corea, or Chick Webb or somebody like that. <laughs> I don't think it happened that much. But now they got this merging. It's, it's very interesting way it's going, right? So there you have it. Well, it's been, uh, it's been fascinating talking to you. It was, a, it was a real thrill to talk to you, Sam. I'd, I'd like to follow your more, more of your music. If you like this channel, support it. Your help allows me to keep on making high-quality music education videos available to anyone around the world who wants to watch them at any time for free. Check out the rewards for varying levels of support at www.patreon.com/samuelandreev. Thanks for watching.